So th thank you for doing this. Yeah, this is great. This. I am. I've read your history. I've looked at your testing. I looked at your scans. So I sort of have an idea of why you're here. Tell me your goal. Yeah. What do you want yeah. out of this experience? I, you know, I've had some like key events in my life that I wasn't really sure how they were impacting my ability to move towards the things that you know really matter to me. I, I played football growing up in middle school and had some pretty bad concussions moving in from middle school and into high school. And not only that, I was a lineman. And so every single play for every practice and every game, I was smashing my head against someone else. I got such a bad concussion, the doctor told me, he was like, hey, if you get another one of these, you could die. Like it's getting to the point where if you get another one of this severity, it could be really bad. And so I, I remember around just kind of this time, school was really complicated for me too. I was held back in fifth grade um, for concentration problems. I, I kind of concluded that some of that was culture shock because in fifth grade, I used we lived in China for about a year. Tell me about that. I saw that you went back and forth to China. Why? So my dad uh, used to work for AOL back when that was a thing. <laughs> so AOL, uh, he just moved up the ladder and was like working different jobs at different call centers around. How, how many years did you spend in China? A year and a half. A year and a half. Yeah. And what city? Uh, Beijing. Yeah. And was there the pollution there mm -hmm. that is now? When you looked up, when you looked at the moon, the moon was brown. I remember that was the first thing I noticed when I got into the city. I was like, mom, why is the moon brown? <laughs> and uh, and I remember uh, these like smog dust storms that were everywhere as well. And we lived in like one of these brand new kind of like houses that was built kind of right on the outside of the city. AOL kind of put us up in a nice place. It was cool. It was brand new, but lots of construction around. But when you just look outside, it was always smoggy. It always just looked like this hazy fog. Um, and there were nicer days, of course, where it wasn't that intense. And was the being bullied because you moved and you were always the new kid or? Mm -hmm. A lot of the bullying happened in China. So that was directly related. It was right around the time. You went to an American school in China? Or yeah, you went we went to, to a, well, a Western school. It was, it was a Western academy. So there's kids kind of from all over the world there, um, English speaking school. But it was right around the time that Bush moved into Iraq and so a lot of the American kids are kind of getting bullied and it's just the consensus, how I interpreted the consensus of the kids at the school was, was really kind of hostile towards Americans. There's a lot of Middle Eastern kids there that were like really frustrated with what Bush decided to do. And so that, that translated. Yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 was, at the time, I, was, I was an infantry medic and an oh, army psychiatrist. Yeah. And I'm like, and why are you sending people there? What yeah. threat is that to us really? I was pretty irritated. So you can imagine if you're a Middle Eastern kid, 100%. your yeah. family's crazy, angry. Mm -hmm. And so being 10, I had no idea what was going on. Like, right. <laughs> I didn't know what Bush was up to. Like, I'm just like, wait, you what? Why do you, why do you, don't you want to let me play? And, and then it turned into a lot of physical harassment. It turned into a lot of just kind of kids sneaking up on me and beating me up and, and it was, I think it was in combination with a few things. I got really reactive to that and really angry. And then it was kind of like, I was well, talking of course, about earlier, it was culture shock to too, of just like, what is going on? And so I, I think I would, it was kind of a cyclical where they would beat me up and kind of harass me. And then I would almost kind of antagonize and get mad back and retaliate. And, and it was, yeah, it was terrible. It was just awful. And then coming back to the States, just having just kind of this reactive defensiveness kind of just pre-programmed, I think I came into fifth grade again in the United States with a lot of um, preemptive anger and, and kind of getting ready to be defensive. People You've are been traumatized. Me. Yeah, I was frustrated and I was angry. And so then that, I think, invited conflict in new ways as I even got through middle school. It's hard. It's hard well, when out. you're ready, when you're traumatized, your brain becomes hyper vigil. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so if somebody bumps into you, you want to kill them. Mm -hmm. Not literally. Yeah, but you react. You react in a yeah. way that's more intense than maybe mm -hmm. needed. Well, should we look at your scans? Yeah, let's do it. So um, we do a study called SPECT, and SPECT looks at blood flow and activity. It looks at how your brain works, and it basically shows us three things good activity, too little, or too much. Yeah. And then my job is to balance it. I was trying to understand why does your brain look 
toxic. And then you told me you lived in China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of experience with Chinese brands. Yeah. And they all look toxic to me because of the pollution. Mm -hmm. So the image on the left is the one at rest. The image on the right is when you concentrate classically in ADD is when you concentrate, your brain shuts down. Mm. Sort of means the harder you try, the worse it gets. Yeah. And both of your temporal lobes are hurt, probably football. And so kicking yourself in the butt is generally not an effective yeah. strategy. And, and your cerebellum here, it has what I think of as um, a dumbbell pattern. It looks like a weight yeah, dumbbell. Yeah. Um, and this is an area called the cerebellar vermis, and it's small. And that's involved in emotion, in emotional processing. It's not a classic bipolar scan, mm -hmm. but, but I think at some point your brain got hurt and Whatever we can do to strengthen that, we want to do. This is gonna give you dementia if we don't fix it. Mm. The cool thing is if you believe me and you do what I say, mm -hmm. it can be so much better. Yeah. I, and this is how much better your brain can be. Mm. If you do what I ask you to do, we can reverse the damage. Mm. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, let me show you your active scan. So here's the active scan. Again, cerebellum is not healthy like it should. We go back to what it should look like. Mm, fully active. Yours is sleepy. And when you concentrate, it drops. Harder you try, the worse it gets. Your emotional brain is busy and the anxiety center is busy at rest. Um, and then it drops. So my job is to calm your emotional brain, activate everything else. Yeah. Ferritin is way too high. Hmm. What is ferritin? It's a measure of iron storage. Ah, so because I eat too much meat? Um, or like mine's always high unless I donate blood. You should be donating blood every six months because mm. that will dramatically decrease your baritone. Yeah. And both you and I, we really shouldn't eat red meat more than once a week. That's the worst news I've gotten so far today. <laughs> <laughs> I love, love steak. But That's does okay. it love you back? It you are in a loves relationship. Loves my taste buds back. Yes. <laughs> but if it so prematurely ages your brain. Is that just... Are we talking corn-fed beef? Are we talking grass-fed beef too? And lamb? All the delicious meat? I have to eat poultry for the rest of my life. <laughs> and fish. And I do like fish. You know, I mean, celebrate a steak once a week. Okay. Or lamb chops. Or donate blood four times a year. Ah, but we need to- Worth it. We need to get iron out of your body. I could do because that. Because it's prematurely aging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, I'll believe you. And there's actually a part of your history I was interested in from you were like 10 to 14, you would have spiritual experiences and you wondered mm -hmm. whether or not they were hallucinations. Can mm -hmm. you talk about that? Yeah, yeah. I. Um... Well, so growing up in like a charismatic church, what was, and, and I shouldn't say it wasn't like hyper charismatic, but I'm, I'm kind of an eccentric personality. So I think I grabbed on to some, just some concepts and really kind of let my imagination fly with it. Cause it was like, it was a culture that kind of accepted that there's angels and there's demons and that they're active and that they can actually oppress and, and, or the demonic forces can actually oppress and, you know, even take over people at different times. And there's angelic forces that are protective. And, and I guess I haven't really understood fully what those experiences were, but I was at the time convinced I was seeing angels and demons and, and actually having these hallucinatory visual experiences, seeing these creatures, you know, alive and active, not just at my church. Fully formed or blurred? Blurred. Mm -hmm. 
blurred experiences, shadows, outlines. Um, and then you would interpret them based on what you grew up in. That's right. Um, I just did a show with Dr. Phil on paranormal experiences. Yeah. And it's often right hemisphere, right temporal lobe. In an area of the earth, there, there are changes in the electromagnetic forces. So you can like get Whoa. a sunspot yeah. or have a certain, like Sedona is, mm -hmm. in Arizona is known for that. And then you have a vulnerable brain with forces in the earth you have these weird experiences Fascinating. and then you interpret them based on the culture yeah. that, that you're in. Not to say there's not angels and they're not demons, right? I mean, who am I to say, right? I think scientists are always curious. They don't know the answer. Yeah. Right. So anyways, that's fascinating. fascinating. So then we have to look at your temporal lobes, especially well, and on I the got, right side. I was worried, especially when I started studying psychology, I was like, is there a part of me that's psychotic? So and, we'll and your faith may have helped you because it doesn't seem like you drink much or do drugs or stuff like that. And um, and you have a deep sense of purpose. Yeah, I do. And all of those things are protective. So um, how would the effects on the temporal lobe produce some of the spiritual experiences? Can you tell me more about how that could be connected? Um, when they fire erratically, then you can have illusions mm -hmm. or like deja vu or the sense of a presence. Um, it's really interesting. There's a wonderful book about this it's called Why Won't God Go Away? Mm -hmm. And talk about temporal lobe function, dysfunction, and spiritual experience. Wow. That doesn't mean spiritual experience. I actually did a prayer study. Yeah. In your church, did they speak in tongues? Yep. So I did a study on speaking in tongues. Fascinating. So we have a foundation and our foundation, one of our donors go, would you do a prayer study? And I'm like, how interesting. Yeah, cool. And so we got nine people, we scanned them, and then we had them speak in tongues and we scanned them while they spoke in tongues. Right. The image actually doesn't happen when you're laying in the camera. The image happens when we inject you. Mm -hmm. So in the injection room, we had them start speaking in tongues. Mm -hmm. We also scan them with a different study doing prophecy and mm -hmm. discernment. And, uh, so the baseline scan was just, I pray for you, conversational prayer. And then speaking in tongues, which neuroscientists would argue it's channeling. You're basically channeling the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the idea is when you channel, you have to drop the activity in your brain so you can be a vessel mm -hmm. and six of the nine dropped activity in their brain. One of them looked like they just got hit with cocaine because the pleasure centers went pop. <laughs> they love it. Yeah, They love oh, wow, it. I'm wow. like, oh, I bet you do this a lot. <laughs> Fascinating. So you're saying that because of the way my temporal lobes may be firing, that that would create a predisposition in, in a context that reinforces hey, there's these spiritual beings being around and they're walking about and having a lot of just personal crisis that I'm trying to interpret, trying to think through and process. There's just this great mix of situations that might have given me a proclivity to process like that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Huh? That is fascinating. Really helpful, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah, I feel it. I feel the um, the urgency of it. I feel the, the need to not just take this casually or to find this interesting, but to really press in. And if you're serious at your age, oh my goodness, it's, it's going to benefit you. It'll benefit all the clients you see. It'll benefit your community. It, it'll just benefit so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the insight. It's such you're a welcome. gift.